The NHS, as most patients see it, the GP surgery on the left and the emergency department on the right, both overstretched, understaffed, and in fact, if the health and social care secretary is right, it's a health service that is broken. It's as busy as it is every day. Uh, I think what changes every day is the flow. So it depends. If we've got lots of sick people in, then the flow slows down. And if the flow slows down in an ED, even if we've seen all the patients, everything slows down because we simply don't have space to work. And it wasn't flowing this morning. This is Queen's Hospital in Romford in East London. And every corridor in the emergency department was filled with patients on trolleys. You know, I said this last time I was here, but I think you guys have just got too used to it. I mean, this is busy. Possibly. When we are full to capacity and we can't move patients from our ambulance assessment area into our majors area, that's when our patients will go out into our corridors. It's far from ideal, but we also understand that, you know, it's a national problem and we try our best, you know, to listen to the feedback that we get from our patients to try and improve what we have. They're absolutely open here about what's happening. One patient, they told us, had been waiting for 29 hours, yet this is not winter, there isn't a heat wave, and to this eye, none of them looked like they'd been celebrating the football. It's easy enough to see where the pressures are when you're in a hospital like this, but the question is what to do about them. So today, the Health and Social Care Secretary announced an independent review. It will be led, as it happens, by Lord Aradazi, who advised the last Labour government and his remit, first of all, will be to diagnose the problem. But he's also been told he can tell the hard truths. Mr Streeting has also been clear that he wants an end to the begging bowl to the Treasury culture. So where does that leave a trust like this, part of which is in his own North Ilford constituency? I think we have to recognise that acute trusts are going to have to do more with the resources they've got to run more effectively and productively within that base. But you could probably increase our funding here by 10, 20 per cent. We could put more beds in, we could put more space and more capacity. In the longer term, that's not going to help the population get healthier and stay away from hospitals. A growing population, older patients, multiple health problems, it's repeated across the country. But now the spotlight is moving away from the hospitals. Of course, fixing the NHS is complex, but one of the proposals from this government is to increase the proportion of money that comes from the NHS away from hospitals and into GP surgeries and into the community because they fundamentally believe that if you can prevent people from becoming sick, if you can treat them closer to home, you can, apart from anything else, take the pressure off hospitals. Six miles down the road from Queen's Hospital is Fullwell Cross Medical Centre and there, one of the partners told me, he works seven days a week. I'm no doctor, <laughs> but I must say I don't think that's very good for you. It isn't. Uh, I think that the, what we're driven by at the moment is the level of workload that we're facing in primary care. Which begs the question of how they will cope if more work comes their way. The way we work in primary care is, is, is pretty historic. It's not, it's not something that, that we can carry forward. It, it needs modernising. It needs modernising because we have to think about primary care teams, secondary care teams, mental health teams, community care team, teams, creating integrated teams that allow more work to be carried out in the community. With that we need the transfer of resource, the transfer of workforce so that people can be seen in the community. This is in the longer term, changing spending priorities, improving prevention, but in the short term, there is this for the government to deal with. The sight of sick and frail patients lined up one after the other in a hospital corridor. Well, earlier I spoke to the health secretary himself, Wes Streeting, and asked him if he was prepared to think the unthinkable when it came to the NHS. I've made it clear that the NHS needs to reform or it will die. The NHS is going through what is objectively the worst crisis in its history. My first impression after a week in the Department of Health and Social Care is that it's even worse than we thought, that there are things that we will put into the public domain that I think people will find quite shocking actually in terms of the state of the NHS. And I think when, when we do come forward and when Lord Darcy publishes his investigation, I think people will be shocked that even beyond the headline numbers we already know about, 
there are also serious performance failures and serious accountability failures. Uh, and, and we're going to be honest about that because I think for a few reasons. Firstly, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, the, if you're going to provide the right prescription for a problem, you need to get the diagnosis right. You said before you got your feet under the table and saw how bad it was in, in your words, you said that the, an NHS free at the point of use was something you were prepared to die in a ditch for. Are you still, having seen how bad it is and how challenging it is, is that still the case? Uh, not only will I always defend the NHS as a public service free at the point of use, nothing I've seen has shaken my conviction that that is the fairest, most equitable way to provide health care in this country. Lord Darcy himself said that when he was a health minister, his, and I quote, his, his big regret was that he failed to persuade GPs to change the way they work. Well, not just GPs. I, I found in the last two and a half years as the shadow health and social care secretary, spending time shadowing people on the front line, they're crying out for change. They are absolutely desperate. And one of the things I was really struck by last week when I said our NHS is broken were the numbers of frontline staff, not just on social media, but also getting in touch directly to say, finally, someone's being honest about the state of the system that we're working in. But you set yourself an impossible challenge because, you know, you said you're going to end this begging bowl culture, in your words, of, you know, the NHS going, your department going cap in hand to the Treasury. But there's a billion pound, multi-billion pound backlog in, in capital investment. There are serious staff shortages. Are you seriously saying that you're not going to need a whole load of extra cash to fix those problems as well as reform? I think the lesson of the last Labour government is that it's investment plus reform that delivers results and that's why I thought it was significant in Labour's manifesto given the tough choices Rachel Reeves had to make as shadow chancellor, she's now having to continue to make as chancellor, that, that she identified the NHS as, as a priority but every bit of that investment is linked to reform. You can't fix any of the problems of the NHS without fixing social care. Um, you, know, you promised a national care service in the manifesto, but there weren't really that much, you know, there weren't many details on timescale or resourcing, for example. You have promised that you'll implement the Dilnot Care Commission capping costs by October the tw 2025. But the NEO says that's impossible, the national, the spending watchdog says that's impossible unless work began last year and it hasn't. Well, I've asked officials to report to me on progress against uh, the deal not uh, implementation. Um, I'm expecting a report on that shortly. Uh, I want to make sure, though, that as well as that, we're delivering the fair pay agreements that we promised in our manifesto so that we can have the care workforce we need, national standards for every part of the country. So we're going to get on with that. So, there, so there'll immediate be legislation. Immediate, immediate first steps on, on social care but a 10-year plan for social care, because it's such a huge challenge for our country, and it is going to take time. It is the most working-class cabinet in history. Do you kind of look round the cabinet table and sort of pinch yourself still? Yeah, uh, there's no other way to, de to, de to describe it. Um, I was so proud um, to be part of that. I, I think that is going to make a big difference, because if, if you look like the country that you're serving, you're more likely to make decisions in the interests of everyone. But has and it sunk in yet? It's getting there. I mean, uh, to be honest, I've been running at 100 miles an hour with a level of hyperactivity. I'm sure if and when I get some downtime at some point, uh, maybe a little bit of a break over the summer, it might sink in. But in the meantime, I've got a job to do. And the NHS saved my life when I went through kidney cancer. Now I'm determined to, to use that life to save our NHS. But you'll pinch yourself in that downtime. You're really health secretary now. Oh, I definitely know I'm health secretary now. I've got the, I've got the challenges coming thick and fast. We're streeting. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, solving the pressures on the NHS would be a whole lot easier if there was faster economic growth with higher tax revenues as a result. And today, Labour got that precise outcome, with figures showing the economy expanded by more than expected in May. So have GDP and the England football team both turned a corner? Our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, is here. Helia. Well, Cathy, you've got to not just turn a corner, you've got to score from those corner positions as well. And let me show you that on the monthly figures, because go back to April and services, that's things like retail and banking, that was doing all right, but the economy was dragged down with production and construction. Now fast forward to May, the hottest May on record, all three sectors of the economy, Cathy, are in growth. Labour's been talking about getting Britain building, but what's interesting is that construction up 1.9%, driven by house building, helping create growth of 0.4%.
Now, that is faster, twice as fast as economists had expected. Now, Labour will want to claim credit for this, but all of this predates the election. Well, um, and you're used, you're used to bringing me do me graphs, so that's really quite <laughs> something. But, uh, you know, it's all about timing, though, isn't it? And in the last, you know, when Labour last came to power, they inherited the major recovery, didn't they? So it's the same thing happening. I mean, you're absolutely right. Timing is everything. And I think the key thing is that these figures might, again, draw focus on Rishi Sunak's decision to call an alert early election in July rather than waiting for the recovery in the fall. But as you were saying, there's lots of plaudits for economic recovery in the Blair Brown years, but recovery didn't come just in 1997. If you take a look at this, in 1990, that was the recession year. Well, John Major still wins the election and actually delivers four years of decent economic growth. It's the, eco it's the ERM catastrophe that mires the Tory party in economic incompetence, allows Labour to sweep in in 1997. Have a look at that, Cathy. 4.9%, the best on record for a decade. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to get a recovery like that, but what's interesting from today's figures is you had the ONS saying that they, they haven't got any red flags on the horizon for the British economy, and we haven't heard that in a good long while. Well, the economy picking up, England doing OK in the football. <laughs> Can it really be true? <laughs> well, uh, I... You know, as ever, I don't want you always call me a party pooper, but, you know, the sting in the tail might be the Bank of England look at these fingers, possibly look at inflation next week and say there's too much heat still in the economy to cut interest rates in August, as so many people hope. I knew it was too good to be true. Helia, thanks very much for joining us.